go with go ahead Good afternoon and welcome my name is jane dutton and i'm a member of the adult formation committee and it's my role to welcome you to the third in the adult formation series this that is focused on the arts as an inspiration for dreaming our third session is fo focused on dreaming through visual arts and we have an incredible group of three women artists from the church who are going to share a little bit about their journey and um, importantly going to also share with us some of their work. So today we're going to hear first from Carol Pawlowski, then Lois Bryant, and then Angie Miller. So prepare yourself to enjoy. Each one of them is going to do about a 10 uh, to 12 minute segment um, for this series. So thank you. And now I think we'll go to Carol. Hey, um, so as, as Jane said, this is Dreaming Through the Visual Arts, and I am going to start. Um, oops. So um, for, the, for over 50 years, my passion has been Africa and its people. That started after I lived in Liberia for a year teaching art at a college back in the bush in the mid 60s. From then on, Africa inspired my art and my teaching, a course called Arts of Africa at EMU for 25 years. But what is inspiration about? Where does it come from? For some ideas manifest themselves in sleeping dreams. For others, they come in daydreams while on a walk, sketching, driving a car, or lying awake in bed before or after the day has begun. An early series I did came from a photo of people loading a bus back in the Liberian bush, an example of the local Liberian rural culture. I was very intrigued and for my art, more interested in the indigenous people than the highly educated affluent students at the college where I taught. From this first photo, I created six different works. Here are a few examples. So here you see the uh, original photo of all these people gathered in the day's um, work back in a, a, a very uh, primitive and rural village called Gabanga in Liberia. The first um, image that I took from this was called Barrels on the Bus 2. And this was done in 2015. It's a woodcut on paper and it was uh, printed out in a uh, nine by 17 inch on a, a rice paper. So this captured pretty much the whole scene, but of course not in full color. Next, you see the image on the right of two girls. The one on the right is uh, barely discernible. And, and then the one on, on the left, you can make out in the center of the uh, photograph. And she's actually reversed as what is what happens when something is printed. In the next series, initially I looked at photographs I had taken and I began to zoom in and crop areas of interest that spoke to me. I would study the results and decide which digital images I wanted to blow up to use. I then enlarged them in black and white, which I colored over with watercolor crayons. Here are a couple of market scenes done in this way. The first is this Liberian market, uh, a very rural scene. Everybody's focused on the uh, produce that's in the center. Um, and, and then um, the women in, in the back are, are not that involved. This actually won um, an honorable mention at the um, Ann Arbor Women Painters exhibit at the Ann Arbor Library. 
Next is uh, Molly Market Woman. And she seems to be more affluent. You can tell from her clothing and her jewelry and just the way the whole market is arranged. Finally, still about Africa, I did some portrait drawings, which were taken from photos of a trip I took to Mali on a vacation in 2008. Here I continued to find beauty in people of color. I always try to elevate them in my work. Both people and experiences were highly inspirational. This first is of a, a Mali boy. He was, um, sitting on a, a rock um, and looking out into space. And this was in the Banjiagara in, in escarpment area. And he has a very pensive pose, um, which contrasts with the uh, next image, whoops, sorry, uh, which is uh, this camel jockey. Um, he was a, our Berber, tour guide is called Muhammad Ali. And he took us by camel 30 miles into the Sahara Desert. Of course, his, his expression is much more animated than the young boys. After retirement from teaching at EMU in 2016, I started to run out of resources from my African experiences. So I decided to think about some other series I might consider. What was readily available to photograph? What was beautiful to me? Where was my inspiration? I started to look at nature. First, I did a set of four larger composites of images from each of the four seasons. These again, I derived from my own photographs. I put the images together in Photoshop and then enlarged them into watercolor crayon paintings on paper. So this was um, a lot more freeing than um, the others, which were done with the same medium, the watercolor crayon. But these I composed on my computer and then blew up onto a much larger scale, the 24 by 18. So it was a composite of, in this case, um, red roses, um, and it's called Summer, a Rose is a Rose. The next was a fall, done in the same way, same size, descending deciduous, done in 2019. And you see the sort of uh, falling leaves at the center. This I actually just put up in my kitchen. I decided to have my house reflect what's, what season I'm in. So I, I take turns with, with these framed works. But this is winter. Wistful Wonderland, and uh, again, a cause, uh, composite of different um, photographs that I put together and then painted on a, a large piece of paper. And lastly, Spring, uh, Pink Peonies, also 2019, uh, the same process and size. These um, images were from taken from the U of M Nichols Arboretum. Most recently, I did a series of garden flowers in different media sizes and details. These were from the rose bushes in our garden. First, I took many photos, then I picked the ones with which I connected, trying different ways of looking at them. Here, I first used color pencil, and then I zoomed in for a larger watercolor crayon detail. So this one's pretty small compared to the others. It's only eight by nine inches done in color pencil of a pink rose. 
Then the next one, I magnified the same rows, but at a, a much larger size, 16 by 16 inches. Um, looks a lot more um, watered down and more of a watercolor um, approach to the, these crayons. And lastly, a red rose, um, again, on a smaller scale and then um, blown up and magnified to 12 by 12 inches. Here you can see some of the marks with the crayon more so than the um, pink rose. That takes me today. What is my next inspiration or series? Is it still finding beauty in the world around me? In today's world of confinement, both from COVID and the weather, we need outlets to lift us up. By making art, it not only brings me pleasure, but I hopefully can bring that joy to others. As we dream, we look for beauty both in the world and in our lives. Then as visual artists, we try to share with others what and how we see. Thank you, Carol. Now we'll go to Lois. Hello, I'm Lois Bryant. Today I'm going to talk about my weavings hanging at First Presbyterian, some related weavings, and my most recent work. Here in the sanctuary, you see my two panel weaving called Arise. The style is colorful and geometric. Arise incorporates the colors of the stained glass windows and the colors of the liturgical calendar. As for its meaning, Reverend Melissa Ann Rogers is so much better at putting it into words, so I'll quote her here. The word arise means to come into being, to originate from a source, to move upward. As you worship with us, we invite you to meditate on the Holy Spirit moving through our church. So now I'd like to tell you how I made arise. Here it is, a work in progress on my loom. Note the ancient computer in the background, which feeds the weaving instructions. That is what warp threads to lift when to the loom as I weave. The warp threads are the vertical threads on the loom. The weft threads are the horizontal threads from my shuttles. On the left is a photo of one of the woven panels. On the right is a drawing and a chart that I referred to as I wove it. I created the drawing in Photoshop. I used to use colored pencils on graph paper. Now I often use Photoshop. And this chart and this drawing you see here is a distillation of these charts. The warp colors, the threading plan, the weave structures, and the two sets of weft colors. So how did I get the two panels to be symmetrical? I wove the first panel from bottom to top and the second panel from top to bottom. Then I turned the second panel 180 degrees, et voila, symmetry. I also made sets of green and purple stoles for the church. The Celtic crosses are woven and then outlined with embroidery. Each stole is nine feet long. The Arise panels, on the other hand, are only seven feet long. The geometric style of Arise and the stoles is reminiscent of a series of weavings I did about 30 years before when I had a terminally ill baby named Allison. My way of coping with terrible situations is to design and make art. I kept vigil at Allison's bedside in the ICU for two months. During her last week of life, when we knew her death was imminent, I brought my colored pencils and graph paper into the hospital and designed departure. I chose to use a grid to represent Allison's body, which in her case wasn't functioning for her. It was like a cage confining her soul. The larger squares in the middle rising up and getting bigger and stronger represent her soul leaving her body. And the little squares drifting off to the edges represent her life energy dissipating. In my third version of Departure, which I designed several months after my baby died, the grid, the body we buried in the ground, is drained of color and off in the corner. And the soul squares now have a color and are free of the grid. It was my hope 
my dream, my belief, that my baby was off to a better place. Designing and making these weavings were my way of praying. Arise is geometric too, but instead of a grid, my organizing principle is columns so that the motifs can rise up unhindered. This weaving, Eden Burning, is hanging in the hallway of church near the stairs. I designed it when Warren was raging in Iraq. I wove this on the same loom as Arise, the stoles, and the departure pieces, but using a very different style and technique. Scholars say that historically the Garden of Eden was probably situated between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which is present day Baghdad. 15 years ago, this is what Baghdad looked like. Fire and mayhem, peaceful, no more. I had this idea of using floral and flame motifs. So for visual references, I looked at things like ancient Peruvian illuminated manuscripts and comics. Now, as I look at Eden burning, I think of the year 2020 and the raging wildfires out west. What are we doing to God's paradise, planet Earth? Are we taking care of it? Another weaving at church is the Beatitudes with the words of Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. I knew it would be hanging in the waiting area outside the sanctuary where people would pass it every <clears throat> Sunday or where people would be sitting for a while waiting for someone's meeting to end. So I didn't want it to be read too quickly or too easily but maybe I made it a little too hard to read. Here's a close up. Notice that word peacemakers. I made this weaving on a very different kind of loom, a computer aided jacquard loom at Eastern Michigan University. When the word peace that is peacemakers came up on the computer screen, I decided I had to take this picture. The image of a cross hiding in plain sight among the golden leaves expresses my belief that you can find the divine in the ordinary. All the leaf shapes were based on leaves I collected walking around my neighborhood in Ann Arbor. The Beatitudes was not the first time I used words in a weaving. These are two little jacquard weavings that are not in the church. On the left is Impact, which I designed shortly after the 9-11 attack. Yes, the slide says 2008. That's when I wove it, not when I designed it. In Impact, you see a jumbled up, tangled up um, mess of words. One set of the words is positive, hope, courage, peace, love, which I consider the basis of the good life. The other set is negative, pain, anger, loss. After the 9-11 attack, the positive and negative emotions were competing within each of us for dominance, which set would eventually win out. The weaving on the right is captives, which I designed during the 2004 presidential campaign. I was angry that certain politicians were stirring up people's fears to get them to, to vote a certain way. I suppose this image is relevant to every election season. Here's a detail of captives. Looking at this weaving now, I see the year 2020. Our access to the good life, hope, courage, peace, love is captive to our fears of the coronavirus, the economic meltdown and various conspiracy theories. So now we get to 2020. I call this drawing grasping at straws or maybe I should just call it panic. I made a lot of embroideries in 2020, predominantly in black and white. To me, color is a hopeful thing. And what was hopeful about 2020 with the pandemic and the economic stresses and the raging wildfires and hurricanes. I call this piece alone together, flourishing and floundering. I made it during the spring stay at home order. But maybe I should stick with my original title. I had some time on my hands. I was getting through the stay at home order one stitch at a time. The colors are subdued among lots of grays and blacks and whites. Then I did a series of smaller embroideries, mostly in black, white, and grays. This one, Midnight in Spirit Garden, expresses the uncertainties and spookiness of living with this worldwide so far incurable virus. Where is it? Who has it? How can I protect myself and my loved ones? Is it real? I embroidered this piece during the 2020 election season and call it 2020. Ah yes, 2020, what a year. The pandemic, the economy, the wildfires and hurricanes, the melting glaciers, plus a divisive election season that strained our psyches and our American democracy too. I could only bring myself to use black thread and then some white, stabbing the fabric repeatedly with black thread and spiky motifs felt good. The only bit of color is brown in the burnt parts. Yes, I burned parts of it. Burning it felt good too. 
After I finished the Embroidery 2020, I went back to doing the finishing details on this one called Moments of Joy. It is predominantly in grays and black, but there are bubbles and squiggles of color here and there, and no spiky motifs. I made most of Moments of Joy in 2019 while keeping a friend company, as she struggled with end-stage COPD, hence the smoky grays. All her life, this woman had been a joyful person, and despite her struggles to breathe at the end, she never lost her sense of humor and her joyful character. I felt compelled to put the finishing touches on Moments of Joy in early December 2020, when hope picked up a little, the divisive election season was over, pretty much, and vaccines for COVID-19 were looking very promising. <sighs> However, the pandemic is still raging and the election season isn't quite over yet. This past week, I've been working on this piece called Kooky and Spooky. This is a detail. I dyed the fabric first and am now adding embroidery. There's a lot of color now, but the imagery is a bit kooky and somewhat spooky. So you see, I create artwork as my way of coping with the challenges of life and as a way of expressing my feelings. And as I said, it's my way of praying. I hope that my artwork touches people on some level, even if they don't know the specific backstory behind each piece. I'm dreaming of a better 2021. Maybe this year ahead of us will be so normal and predictable that my imagery will become less spooky, kooky and spooky, maybe. Thank you, Lois. And now we'll go to Angie. Hi. Do you see my screen? Not yet. Do you see me? Not yet. Oh, I did it wrong. Sorry. <laughs> like all of us, I'm learning. Hold on. I did it wrong. All right, let's try again. Now we can see it. Oh, there's hope for me, but not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Angie uh, Nagel Miller, and um, I was addressing this interesting topic of those who dream. And I'd like to share with you some of my work from the past 40 years. I will also be sharing my journal entries from the time of, of these works. Uh, I'm going to start with this first piece that was um, created in an independent study uh, right before graduation from Eastern Michigan in April 1979. I painted three versions and put many hours into thinking about the color and the composition. At the time I was an expressionist painter. I didn't have a lot of time for dreaming with two children, a husband, a home and school. My journal from um, August 31st, 1979, shortly after graduation was, my so-called studio is piled with junk, so I couldn't get in if I wanted to. I've not painted since May. I wonder at times if I was meant to be an artist. I need to do something every day. That's a laugh. I don't think I have the proper ambition. So I went on to berate myself for another page and questioned my ability. But let's skip um, ahead to 19, uh, 1990. My confidence in uh, my ability to work has settled into my life. Um, and I painted this piece directly relating to the illness of a dear friend who was dying from cancer. I wrote in my journal, Three figures of women, one dressed in yellow, one to represent new friends. Gray clad person and someone in white in the center. I'm not sure how I did these figures so well. It is like it's there waiting to come out. It was a very conscious effort to show how they are always new people to take over and come in when the old dies. It never fails that when a person dies, there is a birth sunrise, sunset, or saying goodbye, 
is the title of this piece. I noted in my journal that I had been studying Udvard Munch and that he had influenced me. Uh, 1992, called Nightmare. So I awoke from a nightmare of an atomic bomb going off. The next morning I went into my studio immediately and started painting. That still clear image in my head. My journal entry from March 10th, 1995. This uh, reflects my grieving over my father's death um, on October 31st of 1994. Emotions continue to run high for me. I did two interesting paintings this week. The first, a cyclone fence with shrubs behind it. This is a painting based on a small sketch I did two days before dad died. Dad's love of bright colors, his circles and shapes in the basement and painting the knobs on the school fence. So then on, after painting this on March 24th, I wrote in my journal, hope springs eternal. After painting those two paintings, I feel released. I no longer feel depressed. And then uh, January of 2001, I wrote in my journal, um, see my mother had died um, in October of 2000. And I wrote, I haven't had that overwhelming grief that I had with dad. Tim said it at the funeral. I'm happy for mom. It was like the suffering was over and she was with dad. Also the way she died and said goodbye to everyone was beautiful. Her peacefulness was amazing. The painting with the leaf reminds me of mom and how heroic she was at her illness. I also commented, my reaction to life takes place in my paintings. So later that year, on October 28th, 2001, this is what I wrote. Life goes on each day but always the thoughts of September 11th are not far from my thoughts. After all these days, I finally have the chance to paint my feelings. This past week, I did a small series of paintings that reflected the horrors of September 11th. One year ago, I took photos of a storm at Mount St. Helen. The clouds are angry and the storm was unnerving. They felt like the storm that rolled through this country on September 11th the darkest part of the storm, the slow retreat of the storm, the hope one saw with everyone pitching in and helping. Five pieces in two days. The need to express this horrific storm came out of my brush quickly. If fatigue had not taken over, I would have done them all in one day. I painted a total of six pieces in this series. So now we're in 2004 and on April 17th of that year, I wrote in my journal, I have just crawled in bed after a wonderful and exhilarating hike from the South Rim of the Grand Canyon. At one point over halfway down, it had a mystical appearance. The black and greens of the rocks were colors I never expected to see. The mica glistened. Nice walk along the column. Colorado River where the emerald green of the water shone against the gorgeous blue black of schist. Wow. So I made it to this magical and enchanting place, the inner canyon on the river of the Colorado. How very lucky and exciting. When I returned, I painted my memories and as the years have gone by and I have returned many times to this location, I continue to paint this uh, magical place. I painted this um, in 2011. Um, I had been in, in, no, no, I wrote in my journal in 2011. I painted in 2010. Uh, I painted this piece after my trip in 2010. It was my leisure trip as we went 
at a slow pace to accommodate my granddaughter who was 10 years old. I did a few sketches and developed this piece based on an area that I had observed uh, several times in the canyon. Forward a year later, and I wrote in my journal, well, I did it after 32 years, I got a first place. I'm very pleased at what better, what a better picture to win with than one from the Grand Canyon. October uh, 2018 was my last trip to the Grand Canyon. And here is some of my pieces I did. The canyon still sticks in my memory long after I return. This was painted in 2015. My husband had died in January of 2014 and I was still dealing with the grief of my husband's death when my dear aunt died in January of 2015. My therapist suggested I use my aggression to paint. The next day I wrote on February 14th, painted an interesting piece, four figures, all somewhat mysterious. I painted them fast and furious with not a lot of thought, quite good. So now we, we get to 2020. And this is called the Golden Fields of West Highland Way. I had traveled to Scotland with my sister pilgrims from First Presbyterian to walk the West Highland Way. I remember how tough the hike was for me, but what sticks in my mind are the golden fields and the rustic beauty that surrounded us. And then this fall, I painted uh, Golden Bulls of Prayers this is from Revelations 5. I picked up my Bible and randomly opened it to this page. I had an immediate vision of what should be painted. I went into my studio and I did a sketch and started painting. The essence was put down very quickly, but a number of changes were made as it progressed. And that brings us to today. And I want to comment that uh, Dave Vandermeer inspired me by asking me to paint a picture of water. And I had been stuck during this uh, COVID in year of 2020. And so I've started now painting like three pieces. So I'm working on the third piece about water. So we will see where that goes. Thank you so much. Thank you to our our three gifted artists for sharing their work. I'm hoping that everyone who has had the privilege of, of um, watching this video, that you'll seek out these gifted artists and, and um, engage them in conversation about their work um, because it's really a gift to all of us. So thank you for um, making this video and sharing your work. Thank you, Jane.